welcome back, Ben. It's really lovely to see you um, in in your in your working working surroundings, which is wonderful. And and also welcome to Zena. And uh, Zena, um, so tonight we're going to talk about um, Ben's wonderful gorgeous book which I don't know how many of you have actually seen it or got it uh, we've just been talking about doing an offer through Garden Masterclass so if you haven't already got it um, for members do um, just uh, you know hold hold fire and we'll sort something out and we will let you know um, so Ben um, the book was published when was it back in May well, no just about May that was it yeah well, early okay. May okay. early May That's, yeah. it feels it feels like because I've had my copy for so long it feels like ages but I know that it has only just been um published and and Zena welcome uh, to us and you are the publisher um and and also publisher of Bloom which is a rather gorgeous is it quarterly Bloom is am I right in saying it's quarterly Zena yeah it's seasonal so it comes out seasonal in. yeah yeah um and and again many of you may be um may have subscribed and actually uh, received Bloom but it is a very very gorgeous um quarterly magazine so um so Ben and Zena are going to talk about um about this their, their wonderful creation, this book. Um, ben, are you going to start with um, talking about, well, I suppose it's interesting to, maybe you're actually going to cover this, but why, whose idea was it? How did it start? Who came up with the idea? Yeah, well, um, actually it sort of came from here, from, from Garden Masterclass, because um, I was doing a, a seasonal talks, you know, through the right, season. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one of your friends wasn't it, Zena? Um, yeah, it's, um, somebody that we've worked with before, a really amazing gardener called Alison Jenkins. Ah, Alison, a good friend of ours. Yeah, yeah, she deserves a shout out because she was. She certainly a does. Yeah, brilliant yeah. gardener in her own right. But she had spotted Ben, and I was chatting to her about who she thought might be good for a seasonal book. Oh, fantastic. Oh, well, that, how wonderful that networking is a brilliant thing, isn't it? And um, so, so. So you came up with, Zena, you came up with the idea that a how-to, I mean, it's a wonderful title, What to Sow, Grow and Do. Um, so we, you were looking for somebody to, to write this sort of book. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the way it works is that um, if we're commissioning from scratch, we're coming up with ideas ourselves. Um, we're just looking at what might work for gardeners at home, what they might be looking for, and yeah. a seasonal guide, like something that takes you through the year. Yeah, that was the kind of loose concept and was the idea that I, you know, I wanted to commission. Yeah. So once me and Ben had connected, it was really up to him to sort of turn that into a fully formed book and to kind of flesh it out and take ownership of what that really means. Yeah. So yeah. We and how how long ago was that? I mean, how long did this take to create? Because it, it's it's sort of always interesting to know when when did you first start chatting about this idea. Well, Ben seems to know really. <laughs> he seems to know exactly. <laughs> he knows the hour. He knows the hour of the day. <laughs> well, it's it's, it's a big moment, isn't it? Your first ever book. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, it was late February, mm -hmm. and I remember the first photo shoot was the eleventh of March. And I remember thinking, "Gosh, we need to get organised." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it was it was quite a short deadline. It went from sort of March, and we aimed to be sort of have it pretty much all together yeah. by mid-September with some time wasn't it for editing and, and various other bits but but with most of it edited as well by that time so yeah so, yeah. yeah yeah fantastic I'm just going to let a very noisy whingy dog out come on move this out quickly out. <laughs> Go on. out. sorry about that I, you know, no I problem really have yeah he's just getting whingy it's that time of the day um fantastic so so would you like to would you like to sort of go into screen sharing and to sort of talk about and show everybody what what we're going on about really yes yeah that would be lovely so i'll start i've got the the magic button um here we go so hopefully everyone yeah. can see that looking good looking good yeah every time i see that cover it kind of puts a smile on my face actually. oh and so, so it should so it should yeah. um but i'll talk a little bit about myself first of all um and then i think Zena will talk a little about herself and then how we came together and then the whole sort of construction and process that the book went through so for me i'm a head gardener of a private garden in west sussex in england and i've been here for 14 years now so quite a long time 
growing fruit, veg and cut flowers. But I, I fell in love with horticulture when I was 19 and I sort of decided I didn't want to um, go to university and study art and have an office based job. I wanted to be outside with nature. And, and we often say, don't be working with nature. But, you know, even when you're weeding a path or something like that, you're actually going against nature. So, so you know, but, um, but I wanted to be surrounded by nature and, and of course, where possible, embrace nature. Um, and that was a really big thing, the nature and the creativity. And I, I put this picture of the meadow area in the garden just to sort of signify that it's a beautiful, lovely, quiet space, you know, a moment. And I'm, I'm really interested in creating those moments. So using plants, creating things, vistas, views artistically, you know, um, this is sort of mid to mid summer, I suppose, because the foxgloves are still going. So um, and the lupins are just sort of finishing, but the roses are picking up. So I'm taking all those indicators, but it's a special moment, just sort of about five, six o'clock at the end of the day um, when the sun is setting and the smells, the sounds, it's all getting quiet after a hectic day. And I absolutely love it. But it's about creating these moments and these these visual sort of spectacles to enjoy, really. And, and the work that goes on behind that, as I say, I've, I've been here 14 years, which is a long, long time. But um, I kind of love that, the fact that I have the quite intimate connection with this tiny little bit of land in, in Sussex, you know, and I, I know it int intimately, the details and um, how the plants behave, um, where the problem areas are, all those things. Um, and we manage and care for it as best we can. And, and I get to do that to the best of my capabilities. So I guess that's part of the reason why I've, I've stayed here. Um, but alongside that, you know, when you stay in a place for a long time, it gives you the scope, the brain space then to start taking on new projects. So perhaps I haven't learned as many herbaceous plants as I could have done if I'd have moved on to different gardens around the world or whatever. But um, but what I have done is other things. So I've managed to do teaching, I've done writing, um, I come on here and do talks and other places. And then now I've done a book. So, um, you know, all of that I don't think would have been possible. And in fact, I've, I'm now in a position where I've got a field and I'm starting my own market garden. So if I'd been moving around every five years or so, I think all of my energy would have gone into getting close to that, you know, acquainting myself with that new space. Whereas here, um, I wouldn't say I'm on autopilot because we're mixing things up all the time and changing. But, um, but definitely, you know, it makes things easier. And um, so this is in spring, again, sort of a nice, cute picture, I suppose, with, with the greenhouse there. But but seeing the blossom, you know, I'm, I'm as well as the space looking nice, I love it to be productive. Um, and it, it's a space for food, for vegetables, for cut flowers, but also a space for nature and also a space for the owners and myself to be in, whoever's enjoying that space. It can be all those things. Um, and that's what really gets me excited. Uh, the other thing is the seasonality. So here in spring, you know, the, the garden's got this energy and, and I did a whole series of talks on Garden Masterclass, which I think are available if you want to have a look at them. But um, really, really enjoyable. And then going on, you know, to, to mid midsummers, for instance, where the colours start to change and, and dahlias that we use for cutting here. Um, that's fascination in the front. Lovely, lovely hot red. And I think it's teamed up there at that moment with them. Um, Bishop of Canterbury, that nice red one. But but yeah, um, the seasonality, I look forward to those dahlias, you know, end end of summer kind of thing where we're cutting loads and other things may start to fade, just as I look forward to seeing the flax in early spring or the sweet peas, you know, from spring through to summer before they get baked. Um, all these enjoyments and sort of highlights are there and change through the seasons. And then going again, changing again later in the season, you know, that lovely sort of tidy, fresh, of spring exuberance is kind of it looks a bit forlorn now a little bit melancholic you know the autumn weather's come in and bash some of the plants and they're taking on other colors the leaves are changing um, and the fruit you know the abundance of fruit I mean it smells absolutely I mean I would say divine it was almost like a cider house by the by the end of autumn with with the fallen apples that are around but we collect a lot as you can see but um the birds love to come in you know come winter time the field fairs will be in pecking at them and you sort of come into the garden in the morning and they all fly up and, and you know, another beautiful seasonal moment. And that's what it's all about, really, for me. Um, here, winter, this is the first frost. So it's kind of autumn going into winter. One of the 
best moments I absolutely love because everything is just decorated with ice um, and it hasn't none of it's gone brown or mushy um, and, and usually the light because it's late in the season is beautiful which kind of brings us on to here where you've got all you know winter time where you see the skeletal sort of shapes of things um, you know takes on a whole different different meaning in the garden it becomes um, less woolly, harsh, um, and then the light. The light is so low. It's a really powerful thing, I think, in a garden in winter. So this is sort of my love of gardening and, and, and how I look at the garden um, and as being part of nature as well. And I'll just leave you with this shot, which is um, looking obviously at the reflective pool out um, to say that I don't, I don't really believe that gardens go to bed in winter. I think they can still be enjoyed. Of course, the contents of the garden so the plants will, will go to sleep or lose their leaves, go dormant. The, the insects, the animals, you know, will hibernate or whatever. But, um, but there's still a space there to be enjoyed. And I think, you know, I love this contradiction of where you get these clean lines or the bones as everyone describes it. And I, I think this is, you know, if, if summer was woolly and fluffy and, and, and quite feminine, you know, this is, is more harsh and spatial and, and perhaps more masculine, I don't know. But in the contradiction, you know, and then, of course, you've always got the next season to look forward to. And that's sort of enough about me. Um, that's where I came from in this picture. But Zena, do you want to say some things? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that passion for seasonality is something that really comes across in the book. Just before I start talking about myself, I think, um, you know, the idea that a garden isn't just for summer and if you know what to do in the rest of the year you can create a space that is like really dynamic and interesting and abundant or just beautiful throughout the year and I think sometimes we just need that little nudge to tell us what it is we actually need to be doing in those other other months to kind of keep keep the garden looking good and like being an enjoyable place to hang out but um Yes, about me. So um, I'm the publisher of Bloom and Bloom is an independent um, publishing house. So we started by publishing a seasonal magazine which comes out in spring, um, summer and autumn. And it's sort of a fusion of practical information that sort of gives you nuts and bolts of how to garden. So it could be anything from, you know, pruning roses to um, growing food from uh, waste pips that you collect in the kitchen so lots of inspiring practical content then it's followed by more kind of esoteric or inspirational stories that tell us a little bit about our place in nature and how we can connect with it or interesting stories about people who are working in or with nature um, and then it's got all the usual great magazine stuff like recipes and shopping pages and uh, it's a great fun read um, so we've been going since 2018 and then in the last 18 months uh, we joined forces with Francis Lincoln which is like a heritage gardening imprint um, and they've published a sort of who's who of gardening names over the decades um, and anyone kind of into gardening will have some books by Francis Lincoln on their shelves so we sort of brought our two aesthetics together, that kind of very um, traditional heritage um, gravitas of Francis Lincoln with a kind of fresh, more modern aesthetic and tone of voice that Bloom brings. Um, and we started publishing Bloom books um, that bear the Francis Lincoln logo as a co-publisher. So not to get too bogged down in complicated publishing, world um they the, the the books have started coming out this year and ben's book is the third book that we've published um very proudly um so yeah we can we can talk about how that came about then yeah you've been busy haven't you Zina? <laughs> <laughs> very um did you want to talk anything about these these few couple of slides that i have oh yeah so this is um some internal pages from our magazine so i think you you can sort of see just even just from that, that it's quite different to maybe the traditional newsstand um, gardening titles. Um, so we try to sort of reach a relatively younger demographic. Um, and 
I think for us, it's kind of, um, our mission is kind of twofold. The, the first is that we want people to feel like their lives are improved by nature, that their mental health is improved, that they're encouraged to be outside and that they can kind of reap the benefits of that. But also by finding that connection, they might caretake the planet in, in, a, in a more kind of a meaningful way. So if you feel connected to the natural world around you, you're probably in a better position to um, look after it and be more kind of environmentally minded. So in everything that we do, as much as we want it to be fun and enjoyable and useful, there are kind of our two things that we want to achieve. Um, and yeah, this is the yeah. ethic that we hope will <laughs> capture people's imagination. And I, I think it's something we both connected with, didn't we, on that first phone call talking about um, a love of the seasons and nature and the benefits that come with gardening and being outside, which we all know. Um, but yeah, this is this is obviously that first shot of the, the book, um, the front cover, which I think is absolutely gorgeous. Um, a little journey getting there, wasn't it? Um, had various different options that we all went through and and I mean in, in Zena's wisdom she said you know this will be something that a, a process that we will work through um, and we certainly did but um I think the result is 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 absolutely gorgeous and sort of captures more than just one image which is is what's lovely about the garden and, and Ben maybe it's a great time to mention Kim Lightbody the photographer because the, the photography is absolutely mouth-watering and um you know, I, I, I would be interested to know uh, probably more from Zena is that, you know, how on earth do you choose your photographer? I mean, there are so many wonderful photographers out there. I guess you're spoiled for choice, but, um, you know, the, the photography is it's it's so sumptuous and it's so beautiful. Um, so, yes, a, a shout out for Kim Lightbody, I think. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So. Um, so. Kim Lightbody and also Sarah Pike, who is the art director of Bloom. Mm -hmm. Um, so between us, when we started Bloom, one thing that we knew that we wanted to do was to um, bring in kind of fresh talent. So um, there are some amazing gardening photographers out there, and we probably can all name them um, award winning garden designers, and they do incredible work. And we do work with some of those people, too, but we wanted to bring in um, a kind of new point of view. So using photographers that aren't traditionally garden photographers. Um, and for this book, um, Kim Lightbody felt like just the right person. So we've worked together on many um, cookery titles and um, cocktail books, craft books. So I've, I've been in publishing for, for many years and I've worked with Kim on lots of different kinds of subjects. But over you know the last two or three years just like me she's become more interested in the garden and the natural world and her photography is shifting and so we thought well this is an ideal moment to see how she would capture a garden in four seasons so it is different it's perhaps not um what a lot of people would expect but it's got an incredible atmosphere um and i think she was working with quite a difficult brief because we were capturing four seasons in three. And yeah. uh, we were also not really shooting the garden that Ben works in, in a, in a, um, as, as a big context, we were shooting quite close up because it was quite a practical book. So we wanted to see the plants that he was recommending. We wanted to see the kind of um, way he was pruning something. And it was, it wasn't giving an opportunity necessarily to see garden design or deep borders. So she had um, a challenge there, but I think together with Sarah, like the way we then use the photography helps to tell the story. Um, and also I think Ben, you should talk about how you worked with Kim because- I Yeah. It was a um, I mean, it was, it was fantastic actually. Um, I've worked with a few, photographers and that for various different things but um I, I mean I'm going to show some slides a bit later of her work and again give tribute to her because the photos are beautiful but um I think watching her just go around the garden she was this very calm almost it was like she was fl gliding floating with this lovely kind of rain mac on and 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 she would just quietly just take away I didn't have to I mean it was all very honest um 
although some things I say to capture winter and, and the photo shoots ran from March till mid September. So, you know, that was one of the stumbling blocks at the start. And I thought, how are we going to achieve this? Um, but Zena said, don't worry, we can use illustrations or other things. Um, but actually, Kim did beautiful photos that, that lent themselves to those different times of year. And thankfully, a bit like this year, we, last March was very, very cold. And also we had that wet summer. So by the end of summer, some things looked a little bit bedraggled um, and coming into autumn. So we did manage to capture it all. But yeah, she was just a very, very calm, easy presence to work with and a joy, actually, a real joy. Um, can I just, sorry, time. Ben, can yeah. I just ask, Zena, I, I'm really interested in that point about um, choosing a photographer that's not traditionally a garden photographer. And what was your um, motive there? Is it is it that you think that they're going to look at things in a slightly different way? I'm really fascinated by that, um, by that choice. So can you just explain why? Yeah, I mean, they, they definitely, most certainly look at things differently. Mm. Um, if you're used to shooting food and craft and you're, you're suddenly faced with daffodils, it is, it is a different um, point of view to somebody who is always in the garden mm. um, and also to somebody who's familiar with plants. So they may kind of hone in on something that they know is a, particular variety or a particular um, point of interest. Whereas I think when you're working with other types of photographers, you get actually quite a lot of interesting surprises. Mm. You didn't normally yeah. see. They see light in a really interesting way, as I'm sure all photographers do. But again, it, it's, it doesn't necessarily have to fall on the thing that a gardening photographer would think it would need to fall on for them. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's really subtle, interesting. I think, but it's, mm. I think you do get something a little bit different if you're working with somebody talented, yeah. Yeah, I remember the first time you sent through those, and I mean, Z, she, there's so many photos, isn't there, Zena? And yeah. so many we had to leave out, but the first lot you sent through and just being taken aback at how Kim saw the garden um, and what she'd picked up on and just, just the honesty, and like you say, the subtlety of, of the images which is really helps set the tone in the book as well i think as as part of you know along with the design and everything but we'll we'll talk about i guess kim well throughout this um but we'll look on to the next slide which is um one of what you wanted to put in isn't it Zena? and i believe it's about sort of how we structured the book and came put things together yeah well it's slightly a question for you really so um, this is the work of Sarah Pike and um, again working with an, a, a sort of challenging brief because um, you can only use black text often when you make a book so you can't start using colour text for reasons I won't go into um, but we wanted to create a sense of seasonality through the book that supported what Ben was saying but also um, helped the reader to navigate this sort of shift in, in the year. Um, so Sarah sort of introduced some color, colored lines and colored open openers and so on. But um, in terms of how we structured each season, it was something that me and Ben worked on together, but I would say Ben, you led it. It was about creating a pattern through the book um, so that a reader didn't feel too lost, so that they weren't constantly wondering like what was going on. So some structure, which I think we've got some pages that show some of the key elements in the book. Um, yeah. This was a big, big moment, wasn't it? The, the double page spread. Yes. Yeah. Trying to squeeze on all Kim's photography and give it room to breathe. Um, meant begging for more pages. <laughs> this is one that we put to good use. Um, yeah, I remember, um, well, actually, before this, and um, when you sent through the first sort of this is what we're thinking of, and you and Sarah put something together, and there weren't even any images of it was just random images. Thinking what it felt really lovely, the space. And at first, I sort of didn't understand it, and I was like, oh gosh, you know, if we haven't got enough space for this, why, you know, why leave white on the page, you know? But actually, it does allow that breathing space that you, you know, obviously, you guys understood far greater than I did. <laughs> Um, but then also I remember towards the end of the process and we did the first mock-up of the book and there were, I think there were about four or five of these double page spreads and it was so luxurious, wasn't it? It was lovely. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but we still had to squeeze in the introduction, didn't we? And I did a, a quick reference for the sewing, what to sew each each part season. And I also did a quick reference for the maintenance of what to sew each part season. Um, and I remember sending that email to you sort of saying, well, I don't you you kind of put it all together and we lost all the double page spreads. And I remember thinking, oh, that's a real shame. Um, and saying to you, well, you know, we could just leave that out, couldn't we? And and I don't know, did you feel the same? Yeah, I think um, it can feel like an assault of information a book and some books do when you pick them up, they're just crammed and difficult to navigate and um, or the opposite, they feel really bare with very large font size that, that you think, wow, they didn't have much to say there. So <laughs> we sort of had a challenge on both fronts where you had given us loads of amazing content um loads of interesting things that I felt like we couldn't really leave out and then we had all of this kind of embarrassment of riches in terms of photography and again yeah it's it's sort of down to Sarah in terms of balancing that so that you get these breathing spaces Mm. you know I think if a book isn't enjoyable if it isn't beautiful if it isn't something that you want to come back to time and time again nobody's actually going to look at it so it needs to be um it needs to be something that appeals, but it also needs to work really hard. And that's something that we try to achieve with all of the people that we work with. So, you know, do our authors and do our writers have something to say? I mean, Ben, yes, definitely does. And can we create something beautiful with it? And then, and if it's working hard and it's looking good, then that's that's a success. Yeah. Um... Here's another one I think we put in for you. Yeah, so this is what I mean by like these structural points. So if every half season, so um, early spring, late spring, early summer, late summer and so on has a task list of 12 tasks and a coloured bar, you kind of know where you are. You kind of can follow the pattern of the year and that you know that you can come back every couple of months and there will be a new set of tasks for you to follow. And if you go to the next slide, you'll also get your plants in season. So Ben's done a really lovely selection of, how many plants was it, Ben, in the end that you did for each half season? I think I was doing 12 or writing 14, and then we were picking out the best along with the images, wasn't it? Yeah. So a while ago now, so it was definitely 12. Yeah. Um, So you, you know what's looking good at that time of year so you can plan ahead um and then we have the things to do section um, which may or may not be the next slide i know celebrate season so um i think this really came from you ben celebrate the season so the book Mm -hmm. is meant to be very heavily practical and help you to organize what you need to do throughout the year but part of that meant um kind of not losing touch with enjoying the season itself and what was on offer just not necessarily only in the garden but just like outside the garden gate as well yeah yeah so we talked a lot didn't we or well, I, I wrote bits about you know whether it's foraging or going to watch bats or you know murmurations anything like that um it was something I think quite important just to again to encourage people to be outside really and and, and enjoy that that moment and that part of the season so and then this is another one um which appears in all all the sections so as well as the task list there's um three big tasks that they sort of it focuses on in a little more detail isn't that right Dina? yeah so just three kind of more comprehensive tasks again mm-hmm. that you know then obviously took ownership of the of the contents of the whole book Um, but picking out three things for each half season that might need kind of more in-depth explanation. Um, So you've got something really meaty to kind of get stuck into every every couple of months. Mm. But I I think what worked well is because I had to plan plan these obviously to deny in advance and and having your eyes cast over them, it was, you know, from a completely different perspective saying, oh, you know, it it ensured that there wasn't too much repetition and that they were varied enough. Um, and then, of course, we had to plan them in terms of photography and when we could get the shots, whether it was going to be in March or, or end of September for the, for the winter and dormant seasons and autumn. 
but um yeah it's, de it's definitely a collaboration but i'm really pleased with how how it's all turned out and and the scope that it covers so and i think this is this is one of mine i put in which again i was just going to shout about kim because um the photo of those dahlias you know it was a wet wet summer they had they were bruised you know that whole thing zina said about picking up on the importance that you may be looking more at the composition or i think it's really really does lend itself and and then the white space that is around it you know it almost feels like a print you could put up on your wall you know a real honest print of of what the dahlias were doing at that day in that point so um yeah and this sort of followed through this is in a section sometimes it relates to the to the text exactly other times it's it's just an image that is really beautiful. So in the introduction here, this is the seed sowing um, sort of summary of what to sow. So it's a quick reference, although it's mentioned within the book um, in each chapter, it's also mentioned at the front, just in case you just want ease of use to think, hang on, what should I be sowing now? And I love this setup. There's this one um, and I'll go on to the next one. So each chapter or half chapter, you know starts with an image a really clear image and um and then the text and the font and how did you come to that Zena? oh again i think just um breathing space and like setting up where you are in the year and what i think one of the things that was quite apparent quite quickly when you sent draft first draft copy is that you have a very interesting way of determining when seasons start and end so you'll like say about like birds that you start seeing in the garden or a particular um a particular kind of atmosphere in the air or in summer i think you just talk about the time when you start drinking gin at like 4 p.m <laughs> so, like, yeah. that's how you know summer has started so there was all of these like other cues um to talk about when the season started and ended not just like a calendar of months um, and so it felt quite important to just start each um, half season in a way that sort of set the scene. Um, mm. Yeah, it's a lovely way of beginning that season, I think, because it does that that bit of text there just sort of yeah, makes you think, OK, here we are. This is where we are. Even before you've really gone too much into detail about the garden, as I say, um, we said earlier, some of the things are actually what might be flowering in the hedgerows or the wider countryside or or what's happening around um, rather than just the garden specifically um but as more beautiful images and here this was on um, a section in, in one of the uh sort of how to's and preserving flowers how to preserve flowers so um this is probably late summer i can't see because of all the screens but um or maybe early summer because the best time to really pick a lot of your flowers is early summer but again we had a load of hydrangea heads that have been dried um the year before hanging up um and and you know kim could have taken a photo of those but actually she just liked to have one quite simply and this um on the left this was um feverfew and sanguisorba that we had um on our table in a t-shirt which is there i mean there were bits of paper and stuff scattered around so it wasn't as tidy as that but um she you know simply you know rather than the dried arrangements that i'd had hanging up she just sort of used that as an example and it's it's really atmospheric the way she shot it, um, you know, which gives another complete angle that maybe it doesn't have to be the quintessential perfect arrangement of dried flowers. You could have something a little softer or wilder or, you know, just something creative, really. And then here's some more of the, um, the, the plant descriptions and the plant recommendations and sort of just trying to organise again what was lovely from the word go is Kim's photography um, looking at the details of things and and I sort of mentioned in the introduction about how I um, think that you know gardening isn't really about green fingers it's about observation really looking at the cues that the plants give us of when the seasons are changing and noticing if something's got pests and diseases before I came on tonight I was um, squashing some box moth caterpillar mm -hmm. outside my door because <laughs> I realized well it's here we've got some you know um, not too much because I've seen the birds hopping in and out of the box and I'm pretty sure, you know, the robins are feeding their fledglings at the moment, you know, back to and fro. So are the blue tits and the finches. So, um, so yeah, but, um, but yeah, the photography um, is beautiful, the way the plants were sort of captured. And, and it was a real joy to kind of write these 
descriptions, these sort of love letters about each of these plants and and um and what what I I liked about them. And then again, changing again, you know, coming into winter, this um I love this shot of um the tool shed, and and there was a few, wasn't there? Because there were so many as we got sort of towards editing the book in the October months and putting pulling it all together. You were saying, is are there any more that you would really like me to squeeze in and and can we substitute pictures? Can't we see? It got to that point. <laughs> um, but yeah, I absolutely love it. Thinking about organising, you know, how do you how do you shoot, prepare for the next year? Well, actually, you know, the seed trays there, um, the seed tr that have been pulled open, the drawers with all our seeds, um, very very simple staking, yeah. And I put this one in as a last point before we sort of go into discussion because. And I think you mentioned it a little bit, there is humour in the book too, and personality like the, the drinking gin at four o'clock. But if you look at the observer murmuration or roost here on what to do, and um, you know, it could have been easy to get a stock image of, of amazing murmurations. And in the text, it mentions places where you can go and see them and, and what times you should look for and all the rest of it. But actually this is of um, one of the blackbirds that like to sit early spring. They love to sit on those big, big beach domes and they were doing it this year. I don't, and just sing their little hearts out, you know, before the leaves come, obviously. Um, it must be a certain time of year just to, you know, let everyone know that I'm here. This is this is my patch and, and um, you know, it's time time to get busy. So, um, yeah, I love the sort of the ironic that the, the text is talking about thousands and thousands of birds. And here we are looking at this really cute little one that's on his own, <laughs> but still authentic to the garden, you know. So, so yeah, that's um, the book in a nutshell, really, I guess. And we're open to conversation or questions. So Lovely. shall I stop sharing? Yeah, if you come out to screenshot, I know I've got a couple of questions and I know we've got a couple of comments and I'm sure there'll be more coming through. Um, but um, I have to say that any book that references when to when to start drinking gin in the, in the, in the afternoon has to go top of my list. I, th I think that's the, that's a first. That's brilliant. Thank you, Ben. I love the way you refer to your plant descriptions as love letters. I think that's just gorgeous. Um, and that's so that's so kind of um, it's so typical of you. Um, I'd love to know how many times did Kim visit the garden? Do you do you know even how many times, you know, to get all those images? I do. It was um, six, wasn't it? Really? Only six? Goodness. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. that's that's we, that's. we tried to sort of time them with key crossover points. Yeah, and yeah. The first one was really initial since I, I found that we weren't going to be going into winter. And mm. it was, as I say, it was literally just turning into March. And I was mm. like, OK, we need to get one because it's we potentially could still get a frost, um, which we didn't. And hence mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's no frost in the book but um but the, you know things still did look very wintry mm, mm. gosh i'm really surprised only six visits that's incredible and i think also what what's what's um fabulous is is the timing of this book because obviously during the first lockdown and then into the second lockdown so many people were were discovering the joys of gardening and and being in their garden and observing nature gosh it was just such a timely book really to have because now I mean I'm, I remember once Ben you said to me oh you know Annie here's a copy obviously you know it, you may not you you probably know lots of this and I thought well actually no Ben this is a book that anybody um can read because it's it's for beginners it's for seasoned gardeners alike because it's not it's full of, of wonderful practical information but it's also your spin on gardening and, and observation and learning about the seasons peppered with all those wonderful things you know about you know lighting bonfires and and you know and all, all those lovely little little points but that's the, the joy of it I think it is it is a book that can be enjoyed by people no matter what their experience is and even the very seasoned gardeners your plant selection when you go through each season I mean there's always something new in there that I think oh my wow yeah I'd forgotten about oh isn't that wonderful and then you know so it's it's something that you can just dip into all the time which is which is you know that's that's the sign of a good book you know if you've got that by your bed and you know you read it each season before the season starts it's setting you up for that season isn't it which is which is wonderful um we have got we've got some comments from christine reed and actually christine 
put a very interesting um, question on the forum before we started tonight, which I will come back to. But um, she's saying, Ben, your passion for plants and their possibilities infuses this, um, infuses this how to book with your soul, such a rarity. And Kim's photos underscore that absolutely wonderful. Um, and then she goes on to say, how do you arrange the garden? Have you separate, have you, um, how, how have you separate the vegetables from the cut flowers? I think it's how do you separate? Are you mixing the plants up to bring the pollinators and the beneficial insects in? Um, I allowed a bronze fennel to grow up by my kale bed and visitors kept the kale clear of the cabbage worms. And, and so, so is, is that part of your kind of um, the way that you garden as well? Definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's, I hate spraying. I didn't become a gardener to spray and, 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 you know, that we have problems with moles or deer, you know, things that we mm. have to deal with, but you know, you don't want to be fighting every day. So um, mm. yeah. And also, you know, a vegetable patch looks beautiful with flowers in it, doesn't it? I mean, we inherited layout of the wall garden. So traditionally, you know, cut into four quarters and each of those quarters and um, Arnie Maynard who designed the garden sort of, yeah, 15 years ago and um, put, rows of cut flower beds and then rows of vegetable beds mm. um since then you know we, we plant sunflowers in in the vegetable patch and um, we put amaranthus in, in sweet corn with our squashes so we're mixing stuff up you know yeah. rather than just you know, monocropping and then um, for things like um my my boss's daughter's wedding and also when i have my wedding when the potatoes came out loads of flowers went in yeah, <laughs> the actual yeah. Veg so yeah, yeah but it, it it makes sense doesn't it to anyone you know mixing up that so i sort of said at the start about having a space that's beautiful and productive and brings yeah. in nature yeah. and letting your herbs go to seed you know for equally for an interesting product to use or just for the simple fact of bringing in hoverflies or lace wings on coriander, you know, dill, whatever. Yeah, so. yeah. I know, Ben, you're familiar with my scruffy little teaching plot down at West Dean and, and it is really scruffy and, um, but people can relate to it because I think when they go to West Dean Gardens, it's like the kind of cathedral of vegetable growing. And then, you know, mine is not that at all. But what I find is having cut flowers with vegetables, I find having cut flowers, mixing them up is, is a way of kind of calming things down a bit, because if you're pretty, if you're having this very productive garden all the time you know and succession if you if you mix it up and, and introduce a bit more of the cut flower then then there's the sort of I think it just gives you a bit of breathing space because they're taking longer to come to, into flower and you can cut them and so on so I think if you want to balance otherwise you know there's a lot of pressure with a vegetable garden and fruit garden isn't there to you know to keep on it the whole time <clears throat> oh for sure and and, and it can be, it can like you say become a little bit hard or clinical you know yes, um, yeah especially yeah. if you're the old school of everything immaculate straight lines and, and completely weed free absolutely, and all that absolutely. So, um, so yeah definitely that the flowers add a lot of fun yeah and, and at this moment um, and yeah. to what could be now christine, no christine oh sorry christine posted a question on the forum before we started which i think mm -hmm. was a really interesting question and it was about familiarity and how do you as a head gardener and you've been there eight years is that right eight, did you uh, say eight um, years? 14 14 years gosh um you know how do you keep it fresh how do you keep how do you not uh, keep seeing things I mean you know what it's like when you you know like if I go into a client's garden and there's a telegraph pole in the middle and I say doesn't that bother you and they go doesn't what bother you you know it's sort of you know how do how do you sort of keep seeing things and, and not stop seeing things so that you are you know constantly kind of changing or um you know how do you how do you do that when you've been somewhere for such a long time um I think the first thing is to just question yourself are you right all the time and yeah. um, on, on things and, and you know I've recently changed up the team and they you know I'm encouraging them but I think before when I was younger I, I did did lean, sort of lead with a bit of a an iron rod and, and my way and this is how we're going to do it and create this beautiful thing but actually um you I've got to a point now where I'm, I'm welcoming a lot more input from from the other team and um, the owners are really interested and um, I've been mentioning for three four years about getting some pots for the swimming pool area which is quite empty and bland yeah um this spring she went out and bought loads of giant pots and most of them ended up around the house <laughs> you know, right. it's it's, 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 what's yeah. going to happen and now we've got to fill these yeah um, and they're just going to bought some more to go on the swimming pool but then yeah. um, you know that's something new um every year sort of well end of the year i'll i'll kind of come up with a job list of 
the big jobs that we want to tackle that year? Do we want to okay. revisit an area? Are we developing a new area? And um, for instance, we're going to be lifting up some of the terrace this summer and, and softening that and actually creating that as a, almost like a gravel garden, right. A, because the grass bit is, isn't working and the dogs are using it as a latrine. Um, <laughs> and then B, the terrace just feels like a corridor to get to the garden. Yeah, yeah. Even though it's softened with Alcamilla and there's thyme mm -hmm. and it's beautiful, it feels like, and actually it's a big space that we could create into a garden in its own right. Yeah, or part yeah. Of a new area so so that's all quite exciting um the other thing is getting out there you know seeing other people what other people are doing that's the best do, way do you get to much of a chance to do that i mean do you get much of a chance to go garden visiting well um i do but it's usually off season though which is a shame yeah. so instagram <clears throat> this i have to oh, say instagram I'm, yes i'm going to chelsea on monday and then on thursday i'm going away for 10 days in the growing season round ireland oh wonderful Lucky wow. you. I, you know, I can't believe it so um, yes. wonderful fantastic but i um i go to australia my my husband's from australia so i go there we, we were going there every two to three years um yeah. and i'm obviously stopping off at other places other holidays um, so you get to see gardens at different times, you know, in America or wherever. And and sometimes it might just be a colour combination or something in a mm. pot that inspires you. Or, yeah, you're at a plant fair and you just see a plant and think, wow, that's really nice. Um, or a picture on Instagram, you know, you think, mm. hang on, what are they doing there? How are they doing that? And it's just pulling all those ideas together and then having people with you that are interested and you can discuss them, I guess. Jeanette Cole's got an interesting question yeah, here. She says, yeah, every, comment, actually. Yes, oh, yes. Every, every project has the seeds of future ones. What ideas popped in popped up when you were doing this book? So, I mean, that's probably a question for both of you, actually. But, you know, has this has this made you think about something else or a different a different take on it or? Dina? <laughs> Are you going to pick the book live on Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> Are we really? We're pretty <laughs> close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, I mean, we did really love working on this and I think you know we created um, a kind of mood and we've got so much more material that I think that we you know we couldn't put in the book so there's definitely a book too um, a book too I'm good. yeah yeah and like I know has lots of ideas for what that could be Oh, and, and Anne is saying, I'm going to buy your beautiful book for my daughter. She's just started to show an interest in gardening, finally, in her early 20s. And the style and the format of your book will definitely appeal to her. And I think I think that's so true because it is it is so fresh. It goes back to what you were saying, Zena, about about Bloom as well. And I've got my copy that, that's probably out of date now, that one, that, the last copy that I bought. But it is it is that it's that very fresh feel that, you know, is is, you know, very appealing and it, it, it's not that sort of traditional format that people would expect from a gardening magazine or a gardening book so it makes it much more accessible I think yeah I think accessible but still authoritative that's what you know we, mm. we really aim to do to talk to people like them who really know what they're doing in the garden mm. It is, it, it is an amazing, I mean, if you walk into, say, the bookshop at Wisley, which is probably the largest collection of books in, you know, you know, it's all, how on earth do you think about, oh, the next title we need, or there's a gap in the market, because it just seems like there's so much on offer. Mm -hmm. Can that be daunting for you as a publisher? Or, or, or you, have you, have you got a list a mile long that you think that, that need to be done or done better? Or how do you, how do you approach that? I think over the years I've really honed the way I commission books um, and I I go through periods of time similar to what Ben was saying where you look left and right you gather different inspiration and it doesn't necessarily come from where you expect it to for example I've never been to that section in Wisley <laughs> so there is there are those phases in the year where I'm on the hunt and looking at different, mm. different things but overall, I don't like to look at what other gardening publishers are doing because oh, interesting. what they're doing is kind of up to them and for their market and for mm. their, you know, audience. Um, and I feel like I, when, when I started Bloom, I wanted to have a more kind of diverse outlook and a kind of diversity of voices and a different mm. perspective. And I kind of feel like I'm quite a good barometer for that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So 
if I understand the instruction or I find it exciting or I want to do it in my garden or it inspires me to get outside, then I feel like it will work for other people who are maybe of my demographic or of my background or are from an urban place or perhaps aren't wealthy or don't have a huge mm. garden of their own. And so I think, you know, it sometimes pays not to compare to other. Yes, other yeah. Yeah, no, I think, and, and and it's a little bit like your approach of, approach, you know, using a photographer who's not a, a traditional garden photographer. You're getting, you're getting a sort of fresh, uh, and and you're not, you're, you're un uninhibited really about about the way you go forward, which is which has got to be good, really. Um, Christine's also saying, how was your approach to the, or how has your approach to the garden where you've worked for fourteen years changed over time? You mentioned listening to the crew, but have you started? um caring for things differently for example um for example do you move a plant instead of pruning it are you using more annuals or natives or particular types of plants yes yeah, that's really interesting so in my own project in the field i'm i'm i started off the meadow area that you saw at the start that was um always had stipa gigantea in it from 14 years ago um, and various other ornamental plants and i'm quite interested in mixing that so uh the slip garden now has become my trial ground where i'm you know growing veronica customs um we are weeding out docks and nettles because they seem to be too thuggish <laughs> but um but, but you know agapanthus is still doing really well at, at, the, at the edges um as does um what some of the grasses and um, calamagrostis carl forster has done really well competing with other grasses uh -huh. um so it's yeah so that i'm definitely doing a bit more of that with a view to creating these big sort of swathes um, sort of semi-managed swathes on my field mm -hmm. um but we also the cut flower beds that at the start I mean they were we've got 35 of them and they as we started to increase the variety um you had to squish things in and you almost treat them like mini borders and so you know the joy is we can pick new things that we've never grown from seed or whatever or get some plants and propagate them by cuttings try them in the book and then bring them into the wider garden think oh actually maybe they will work better there or that plant will do well so so yeah we're definitely doing that um regarding trees and shrubs we haven't planted masses um i mean in the wider part of the garden we have um but but i'm conscious of you know when i got there there was a row there was a magnolia stellata a big old cherry that was half dead that was going to come out anyway a sweet chestnut and a a um beech a dark beach and they were all within 35 40 meters in a line cutting mm -hmm. the the lawn in half and it was like right well two of them need to go <laughs> and so we got rid of the cherry and the magnolia and um, left the um and which left the most amount of space for the other two and sure enough you know 10 years 12 years on these trees have become balanced they're looking a lot better so i'm, I'm very cautious about planting new trees we're planting smaller ones so we've done cornus um various different corners some of the aces um aconitifolium but um but yeah i'm i'm i'm, I'm very yeah mm, cautious mm. about adding adding shrubs but um so i don't hopefully don't have to move too much about and how much um your client your 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 employers rather i mean how much input do they have um and do they and have they had more input or less input as time goes by i mean how is the relationship with them developed yeah so at the start, there was always there was a really good amount of trust, you know, straight oh. away. Um, and Arnie was still involved um, uh -huh. for that first year or so when whilst the garden was just bedding in. He was watching it quite closely and watching what I was doing with it. Um, and so were the owners. But then the owners then sort of started to get more ideas because they are interested, you know, oh. and Therese has done courses in gardening um and and tim loves all sorts of, of of plants or flowers i mean he's out there every night relaxing if he's at home you know drinking mm. a glass of wine looking you know mm. i see him when i shut the greenhouse sometimes the lights are on in the greenhouse and he's in there making notes or doing something but oh, in the garden yeah. you know yeah. so i'll yeah. come back later when it's a bit darker um but they have opinions then they have specific opinions which is really nice again i think that's probably why i've stayed there because when they say they like the garden is looking lovely they won't just say it's lovely they'll say those flowers over there or that iris there or, or the mm -hmm. blossom this year has been really long mm -hmm. um you know the apple blossoms been all stayed around for three three and a bit weeks which usually it's after a week and a half the rain knocks it off you know yeah. um so they're very specific uh a good example actually was um therese bought a vase in march and she said i only bought it because of the sweet peas 
Um, and I was like, okay, sweet peas. And she said, can we grow sweet peas this time of year? And so sure enough, we did. And we grew them in through the greenhouse. We sowed them in the autumn, but kept them warm. And they did flower. Mm -hmm. It was a faff. Um, <laughs> and, and I wouldn't really recommend it, but we did it. You know, and that's how you learn, is don't you? And you experiment and you move forward. And, and yeah. so they're definitely as much part of the, the thought process and how we take the garden forward as, as is the team um, yeah. as am I. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. No, that, that, that sounds fantastic. And as you mentioned, Ben, you know, if anybody has missed Ben's webinars that he, you know, we did four seasonal webinars throughout the last year, they are available on the website in the recorded webinar section. So they're there to be viewed. Um, so I think if, if there are any more last minute questions, oh, yes, um, Christine, again, how interesting, uh, so interesting how much interaction between owner and garden, gardener and designer um, impacts on what is possible and the traje trajectory of the garden. It's true. It is, it was, it's very much a sort of um, a sum of all the parts, isn't it? I mean, you, you all work yeah. together really closely. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's also about trust as well, allowing someone to do it you know yeah, and, yeah. and st stepping back so Arnie was very good at that at times mm. um and again my employers have allowed enough freedom that actually we do take ownership of the garden and we do feel it's ours and we want to go further you know um but equally so, uh, you know they've, they've provided a surface to knock ideas off so yeah yeah, it's, it's yeah. wonderful wonderful well I think you both deserve huge congratulations I mean what what a fabulous achievement I'm sure it's going to do amazingly well and I'll be interested to to hear about book number two where where it goes from here and if and if people are interested in bloom um it the, the, the website is bloommag.co.uk isn't that right Zena? if people haven't seen it or want to um subscribe so it's bloommag all one word .co.uk and then if anybody's interested in the book if you give us a day or so we will have a link on our um members page and um so you'll be able to get a little bit of a discount um, and, and be able to buy it. So thank you both so much for giving up this lovely, gorgeous evening when you could be drinking gin in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's been lovely having you back. Lovely to meet you, Zena, and congratulations to both of you. It's been um, it's a great, great success. And uh, and also yeah, good luck um, with it. Good luck. Yeah, with it. it's yeah, it's really yeah. Good. yeah. No, really wonderful. So yes, thank you very much. And thanks everybody for tuning in. And um, we'll see you very soon. And, uh, and if you if you want to um, add any more questions or uh, anything on the forum, please do go into the forum, you get to it through the members section, um, where's lots of wonderful interactions going on people raising questions, suggesting speakers or suggesting topics. Um, it's 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 been very popular already. So please do have a little look through and um, see what see what you can add. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. See you all soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.